Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, uh, we will focus on symmetric and alternating, alternating groups and then prove some of their uh, basic properties. So, first uh, uh, let us recall what is uh, symmetric group. So, symmetric group uh, is the permutation group on this uh, n letters 1 to n. Okay. So, recall. So, the symmetric group by definition it is the permutation group on this 1 to n. So, we have already seen that the cardinality of this S n is actually n factorial. So, we have used uh, many different notation to denote uh, the elements of the symmetry group. So, we will actually stick with the following notation throughout this lecture. So, we already proved some important results about uh, the symmetry group. So, one of the main result is the Cayley's theorem. So, what it states, let me recall the statement. So, here is the Cayley's theorem. So, what it says, if you start with the finite group of order n, okay, so then it is isomorphic to a subgroup of S n. So, that is what it says. So, any finite group of order n is isomorphic to a subgroup of S n. So, this shows importance of this uh, symmetric groups. So, understanding the symmetry group and its subgroups amounts to actually uh, from the Cayley's theorem amounts to saying that it, it is actually to understand all finite groups, it is enough to understand all subgroups of S n. But anyway, the classification uh, problem is not that easy, classifying all subgroups of S n is not uh, some easy problem. So, let us uh, now work with symmetry group and then uh, try to prove some of uh, its basic properties. So, first let us fix some notation. So, if you start with uh, an element sigma of S n, okay, so we can use this notation I n to denote this 1 to n. So, then you take some element sigma. So, which is which is a permutation of this 1 to n. So, in particularly it is a bijective map from i n to i n. So, this is a bijective map. So, in order to actually uh, note down what the sigma does to this 1 to n, it is actually enough to understand image of each i. So, we can use this shorthand notation to write down the same map as follows you write the domain on the top 1 to n and then you write the image sigma of 1, sigma of 2 at the bottom. Okay. So, this is the shorthand notation that we were using before. Okay. We can also use this one line notation. Okay. So, we can also write sigma as sigma 1, sigma 2, etcetera, sigma n. So, this is called one line notation or word notation but uh, this is something we are not going to use in this lecture. So, we will stick with this particular notation. So, now uh, recall that what is a cycle of length r. So, it is a very specific element of the symmetry group actually it permutes some particular uh, indices in, in a cycle cyclically. So, let us uh, define it properly. So, here is the definition. So, we want to define what is called cycle of length k. So, cycle of length k by definition it should permute k many number of indices cyclically. So, you start with uh, uh, some, okay. so you, you start with some sigma which is in S n. So, this is called a cycle of length k if it permutes some k distinct indices cyclically. So, what does it mean? So, if there exist distinct indices, so distinct elements okay, a 1 etcetera a k 
from this i n such that if you apply sigma on a 1 then you get a 2 and then you apply sigma on a 2 you get a 3 and so on. Then when you apply sigma on a k you get back a 1. So, this should be true okay. and if you take any other i outside this a 1 etcetera a k then that should be fixed for any i which is not coming from a 1 etcetera a k. So, that means it just cyclically permutes. So, using this uh, pictorial uh, definition you can see that. So, sigma actually maps a 1 to a 2 and then a 2 to a 3 and so on. Then finally, it reaches a k and then a k is mapped to a 1 under the sigma. Okay and it fixes all other elements i which is not from a 1 etcetera a k. So, if sigma actually satisfies this property then we denote sigma as follows. Sigma uh, is denoted using this parenthesis notation parenthesis a 1 a 2 etcetera a k. So, note that we do not put comma in between these indices. So, this is the notation for the cycle of length k which is defined as above. Okay. So, now uh, what is transposition? So, recall that transposition is nothing but cycle of length 2. Okay. So, here is the definition a cycle of length 2 is called transposition. Okay. So, now why these things are important? So, we are going to prove one important uh, structure theorem for, for permutations. Okay. So, which states that if you take any permutation sigma of S n then that can be written as product of disjoint cycles. Okay. So, in particularly uh, if you understand what happens how to multiply these uh, disjoint cycles then you understand. Uh, everything about permutations. Okay. So, let me just uh, do an example and then later we will actually prove that result. So, for uh, cycle let us see the following example. So, you start with uh, this sigma. So, which is uh, let us say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 from S 5. So, where 1 map to 1, 2 map to 4, 3 map to 2, 4 map to 5 and 5 map to 3. So, then if you think about it then you can see that 1 is map to 1. So, it is not actually does anything on 1, but if you take all other indices. So, then what it does it is actually uh, permits them cyclically. So, you can see that 2 is map to 4 and then 4 is map to 5 and 5 is mapped to 3 and then 3 mapped to 2. Okay. So, in particularly this sigma is nothing but a cycle of length 4 2 4 5 3. Okay. So, this is one example of a cycle in S 5. So, now uh, it is not hard to see because sigma actually permutes this a 1 etcetera a k cyclically. So, if you think about it if you take a cycle of length k if you denote it by a 1 a 2 etcetera a k. So, using the same cycle notation you can see that this is same as a 2 a 3 etcetera a k a 1 and you can actually cyclically permute them and then you can see that the, the, this is same as a 3 etcetera a k a 1 a 2 and so on. Then finally, you can reach to a k a 1 etcetera a k minus 1. So, all this cyclically permuted uh, okay, permu uh, cyclic permutations you start with this particular one and then you obtain all other cyclic permutation by cyclically permuting those indices then we will be getting the same sigma. So, we do not change it. Okay. So, that is very clear from the definition. So, 
So, using this notation we can see that this must be true. So, now uh, what we are going to do we want to talk about this cyclic decomposition of a given permutation. So, for that we need to first understand when given two permutation called disjoint. Okay. So, what, what is the meaning of disjoint? Okay. So, you look at the permutation. So, the permutation fixes certain points. Okay. So, those points are not important. So, permutation indeed uh, read from from those indices that are actually really permuted by sigma. Okay. If it is fixed then it does not do anything on that uh, particular fixed point subset. So, in particularly if you want to call sigma tau they are elements in S n. So, they are said to be disjoint. So, they are disjoint. If you look at all those indices that are not fixed by sigma those i in i n such that sigma phi is not equal to i. So, this set should be disjoint from those j in i n such that which is not fixed by tau. Okay. So, this should be disjoint. Okay. So, what is the meaning of that? So, if you think about it a permutation sigma is actually somewhat uniquely determined by the action of sigma on this set those indices which are not fixed by sigma. Similarly, tau is also determined by the action of tau on this particular set those indices which are not fixed by tau. So, now what we want to say sigma and tau they are disjoint so they do not have anything in common that means these two sets must be disjoint. Okay. So, that the action of sigma is very different from the action of tau. Okay. So, now once we understand the definition it is not hard to prove the following proportion. Okay. So, I will leave it as exercise if sigma and tau are disjoint then they must commute. Okay. If sigma tau if they are disjoint. So, then if you just take this product sigma tau that should be same as tau sigma. So, why it is the case because you just compute the action of sigma tau on some given in index index i. Okay. Then you can see that this i if it is not coming from okay these two sets which are there in this. So, then it has to be fixed by both sigma and tau. So, then the action on both sides sigma tau and tau sigma will be same. And if it is coming from one of them you can see that since sigma is determined by this particular set. So, this particular set okay, if, if this i comes from this set then tau does not do anything to that. Okay, so, what so let, let me just write down the proof because the proof is not that hard. Suppose i is not coming from let us say call this set is a sigma and then this set is a tau. Okay. So, if this uh, i so let me call uh, using different notation let us take this a which is not from a sigma union a tau. So, then you can see that sigma of a will be a and tau of a will be a. So, in particularly sigma tau of a will be exactly a and as well as tau of sigma of a. Okay. So, now this if this a comes from this a sigma so, then what happens? So, because a sigma is disjoint from a tau you can see that tau of sigma should be sorry tau of a should be a. In particularly sigma tau of a is going to be sigma of a and similarly tau of sigma of a is going to be tau of yeah. So, if sigma is actually a is coming from a sigma. So, then we have to see what, what it means. So, it means 
sigma of a is not equal to a. In particularly a is also not equal to sigma inverse of a. Okay. So, since sigma of a is not equal to a, you can see that uh, this tau, the sigma of a also cannot be inside. Okay. So, let us see. So, what we need to say? We need to say that tau actually fixes the sigma of a. So, it is enough to see that sigma of a cannot be inside this a tau. Okay. So, because a tau, uh, uh, a tau is nothing but those indices j such that those indices inside i n such that tau of j is not equal to j. Okay. So, if we can say that sigma of a cannot be actually fixed by this uh, tau of uh, by tau then we are done. Okay. So, since sigma of a is not equal to a and uh, you can see that uh, sigma of sigma of a is going to be either fixed or not fixed. Okay. But anyway, so what we need to say? Um, So, note that uh, sigma of a is actually not equal to a. So, in case tau of sigma of a is not equal to sigma of a, then that would imply that sigma of a is actually inside this a tau. Okay because a tau is defined to be those indices j such that tau of j is not equal to j. So, since uh, a tau and a sigma they are all disjoint, okay, you can see that this forces that sigma of a, if when you apply sigma on this, that should be exactly equal to sigma of a. So, this would say that sigma of a is not in a sigma. So, that means sigma when you apply on sigma of a, then that should fix sigma of a. But now you can apply sigma inverse on both sides. So, applying sigma inverse, so we get sigma of a equal to a. You apply sigma inverse on this, then you get sigma of a equal to a, which is a contradiction. So, that forces that tau of sigma of a must be exactly equal to sigma of a. So, that is what we wanted to prove one hand we have sigma tau of a equal to sigma of a on the other hand we have tau of sigma of a equal to sigma of a. So, this says that sigma tau of a is same as tau of sigma of a. So, now we have chosen a from a sigma similar argument will hold for if you choose a from a tau. Okay. So, that actually completes the proof. So, basically the action of sigma determine on this a sigma. Similarly, the action of tau is determined on this a tau. If they are disjoint, then when you compose them, they do not actually interact with each other. So, they must commute. So, that is what this uh, proportion says. Okay. So, now we are ready to state our uh, main result. Okay. So, let us take uh, any permutation sigma in S n. So, here is the theorem. So, for any sigma in S n, so there exist unique okay, uh, cycles tau 1 etcetera tau k such that. So, they are all disjoint cycles. Okay. So, given sigma in S n, there exists unique, let us call it tau 1 etcetera tau k. So, the order is not important. So, I can put this uh, collection tau and etcetera tau k of disjoint cycles such that the sigma can be written as the product tau and etcetera tau k. 
so since they are all disjoint cycles the order in which you take this product that doesn't matter okay because for any permutation so you can actually permute of 1 to k you can permute this tau 1 etc tau k and then take the product of them so that will be still equal to sigma so this because of this disjoint so we are allowed to permute this tau 1 etc tau k so let us see how one can actually prove this theorem so before actually proving this theorem let us see one example so more or less the example actually tells us what to do uh, with this uh, result so let us consider this particular sigma which is coming from s9 okay so to take 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 so this is from s9 so let us say 1 goes to 4 2 goes to 7 3 goes to 1 and 4 goes to 3 5 goes to 2 6 5 9 8 so now what we want to do we want to actually write this sigma as product of disjoint cycles so then if in case if you are able to write given permutation as product of disjoint cycles you can see that each cycle that appears in that decomposition so they do not interact with each other okay and if you think about it okay if you fix one cycle and then look at its action on given some element in that cycle okay some index in that cycle so that cycle is indeed takes okay all other elements in that cycle can be obtained by applying that cycle repeatedly on that particular index okay so let let me just uh, state what i what i'm trying to say if you write sigma as let us say tau 1 etc tau k and tau 1 is nothing but some a1 etc ar then you can see that this tau 1 tau 2 they will not have anything in common okay in case if you want to get tau 1 then what you need to do you can pick a1 and then you can repeatedly apply this tau 1 on this a1 so then a2 will be obtained by tau of a1 and so on then ar will be just tau of ar minus 1 which is same as tau r minus 1 on tau 1 r minus 1 on a1 so what i'm saying so you start with this a1 repeatedly apply this tau 1 on this a1 then you obtain all other elements that appear in tau tau 1 okay so that way you can reconstruct this tau 1 but if you think about it this tau 1 is nothing but a1 tau 1 a1 etc tau r minus 1 a1 tau 1 r minus 1 a1 but indeed since sigma is actually product of this tau 1 etc tau k so then it says that this tau 1 restricted on this a1 tau 1 a1 etc tau 1 power r minus 1 a1 so this should be same as sigma restricted on this set a1 etc this ak so this means if you are interested in writing this tau 1 in terms of sigma then you can see that this is same as you start with a1 you apply sigma on a1 and so on so you repeatedly apply this sigma on a1 then you get back all other elements okay so this tells us that in case if you are able to write sigma as product of disjoint cycles then if you want to recover tau 1 then this is the way to recover you pick one index that appear in that cycle decom cycle then you repeatedly apply sigma then you get back all the other elements from that cycle similarly if you go to tau 2 then what happens you pick one index in tau 2 and you repeatedly apply sigma then you get back tau 2 so this is the way you get all tau 1 etc tau k okay so this algorithm works for general permutation in general symmetric group okay so let us try to do this for this particular example so this sigma so you can start with any index okay for example i can start with 1 
So then you see where this 1 goes, so you can see that, so this 1 goes to 4 and 4 goes to 3 and 3 goes to 1. So then if I want to write down this uh, cyclic decomposition, then you can see that I can start with this 1 and then go to this image 4 which is sigma of 1, then go to its image under sigma which is 3, sigma of 4 is 3, then sigma of 3 is 1, so then the cycle is closed. So now you have made one cycle, now you if you want to go to the next cycle, so because all of them are disjoint, so which cycle you choose first does not matter, okay, that means which index that you choose does not matter, so you can now go to some index which is not presented in this first cycle, okay. For example, what I can do, I can go to 2 and then I can start playing this similar game. So you can see that 2 is mapped to 7, 7 is mapped to 5 and 5 is mapped to 2 again. So this, then the second cycle will be you take 2 and then it mapped to 5, sorry, 2 mapped to 7. 7 map to 5 and then 5 map to 2, so this cycle closes. So now what you can do, you can take some index which is not in both of them and then you can actually start playing the same game. For example, 6 goes to 6, so there is nothing to write, you can write just 6 here and then if you go to the next one, so let us take 8, then 8 goes to 9 and then 9 goes to 8, then this will give you 8, 9. So this is your cyclic decomposition of sigma into product of disjoint cycles. So now if you want to double check whether what you did is correct or not, you can see that if you want to actually just calculate uh, what is on the right side, okay, this is something like product of cycles, you can see that for example, what will be the image of 8, so the 8 goes to 9, but 9 in this particular cycle it is fixed, so 9 is fixed again here, fixed again here, so that means in this product 9 actually goes to 8, so 9 only goes to 8. Similarly this 8 actually goes to 9 and then 9 is fixed, so 8 goes to 9, so 8 goes to 9 and 9 goes to 8, that is all happens here because in all other places 8 goes to 8, 9 goes to 9, so because of that you can see that the only effect that will have okay, that is on 8 or 9 that comes from this particular cycle at the end. Okay. So this proves that you can actually write down this cyclic decomposition by looking at some particular images of some indices. Okay. So how to make this more rigorous? So already we have seen that this is what we should do okay, from this uh, cyclic decomposition. So let us do it rigorously. Okay. So to do this rigorously, what we need to do? We need to define an equivalence relation on this 1 to n. So define the following relation, define a relation, call it tilde sigma on this i n, so which is 1 to n. Okay. So how it is defined? So this is defined as follows, so for i comma j comes from i n, we say i is related under sigma, okay, tilde sigma, i n j are related under tilde sigma if and only if there exists k in z such that sigma k power i equal to j. So we want to say that by applying some higher power of sigma on i you will get j. So note that we are in the group, okay, finite group, so sigma inverse is going to be some power of sigma. So even though we have allowed k to vary over integers, so indeed it will vary only from 0 to infinity okay? and it will not vary over up to infinity. So because we are in the finite group, it can vary over up to order of sigma. Okay? 
but anyway it's it's comfortable to actually define this way so now uh, once you have defined this you can check that this is indeed equivalence relation so tilde sigma is on equivalence relation so how do how do we check so we need to check three things so first it is uh, it is reflexive okay so first you can see that so i is related to i so by taking k equal to 0 so sigma power 0 you can identify with identity so that's obvious the second thing is if i is related to j then you can see that if and only if there exists k inside integer such that sigma power k i equal to j so now by applying sigma power minus k you can see that sigma power minus k on j is going to be i so then if and only if you can see that j is related to i so now what is the third condition so this is symmetric reflexive they are done so now the transitive condition if i is related to j and j is related to k so then we want to say that i is related to k so note that if i is related to j then we have some k such that sigma power k of i equal to j for some k in z similarly sigma power k dash of j will be k again for some k dash in z so now from this you can easily see that sigma power k dash plus k on i is going to be sigma k dash of sigma k i which is going to be sigma k dash of j so which is going to be k okay maybe i should use some other index so maybe this i will call it uh, r so this is j is related to r and sigma of k dash of j is r and then this is going to be r so they, that shows that this i is related to r by this tilde sigma so this proves that this uh, relation that we have defined tilde sigma is indeed equivalence relation so once we know that this is an equivalence relation then you you can easily see that the set i n can be decomposed into disjoint union of equivalence classes okay now look at some particular equivalence class and then see what it is okay i will leave it to you to verify this is not very hard if you fix some i in this i n then this equivalence class related to i okay with respect to sigma tilde sigma so this is going to be just sigma power k of i where k ranges power integers it's basically you apply sigma on i repeatedly so then whatever index indices that you get so that will be your equivalence class okay so this is also same as you take i you apply sigma on i and so on and you go along like this okay so this is going to be exactly your equivalence class so now from this uh, we can easily see that this i n can be written as disjoint union of these equivalence classes okay so this you call it orbit of i because you are looking at the action of sigma on i and then you are taking repeat repeated action of sigma on i so that is called the orbit of i okay so this we can call it orbit of i so all these things are related to group actions which we will see later okay but anyway this we are talking about a particular group action here okay so later when we come to group action it will become clear what group we are talking about and which group is acting on which so anyway so this i will now vary over some indexing set capital lambda 
what is this capital lambda so capital lambda chosen to be a subset of i n which is the indexing set set for each orbit so you choose capital lambda from i n such that whenever you take lambda intersection with some orbit so this has to be exactly single term for each orbit o i okay so it is a indexing set chosen from i n such that lambda intersection o i is exactly 1 so basically what we have done we have partitioned this i n into smaller smaller subsets okay so these are all some orbits o i so then in this o i what you do you collect one element i so then you form this capital lambda so capital lambda is just chosen something from this each orbit and then you collect them together and form a set so that is called this indexing set of this orbits so now it's very clear that this in is just a disjoint union of all these orbits okay so now if you go back uh, to your sigma you want to write this sigma as product of disjoint cycles so then it is clear that what this sigma does to each orbit so it is easy to see the sigma maps the orbit to orbit okay because by definition of this orbit you can see that so you have fixed this i you have repeatedly applied sigma on that i so that implies that the sigma just leaves this orbit invariant and any invariant subset okay of this i n under sigma will be union of these orbits okay so any s of i n such that sigma of s equal to s so this maybe you can take it as exercise is union of some orbits y okay so any invariant subset sigma invariant subset is going to be union of some orbits so these are all the important properties now you can see that so once you have realized this so then because oi is going to be subset of in in is finite so oi oi can be actually listed as some a1 etc ak now if you think about it that a1 etc ak can be obtained from a1 by repeatedly applying this sigma okay so if you if you denote this by a1 etc ak where this ai is all dis distinct so then you can see that there there is a natural permutation that is associated with this y so what you do you define this sigma i okay as follows so define sigma i from this i n to i n such that so what what is how it is defined so it is exactly defined the way it acts on this uh, orbit okay so sigma i is going to be restricted sigma i restricted to oi is going to be sigma and sigma i on all other elements is going to be identity on this i n difference oi so you just take sigma i to be sigma on oi and then you take it is identity on all other elements okay so if you think about it what it does so sigma i of a is going to be sigma of a if a comes from this y and it is going to be identity if b is not coming from this y okay so then it is clear that the sigma i is nothing but permutation on 1 to n okay so this is is indeed a permutation not only that the sigma i is indeed a cycle of length k okay so sigma i is this a1 etc ak 
where this a1 etc ak fixed as follows where this oi is given to be a1 where a2 is sigma of a1 and then a3 is sigma of a2 and so on then ak is sigma of ak minus 1 okay and the cardinality of this y is nothing but k so basically the sigma i just permutes all the elements in that orbit and since sigma i is nothing but sigma so it just coincide with uh, the same action so now uh, all this orbits are disjoint so that actually simply says that all these sigma i's are mutually commuting the sigma i's where I range from let us say there are R orbits, okay. So, let us say O1 etcetera OR, maybe let us call it OI1 etcetera OIR are the distinct orbits or disjoint orbits of IN, okay. So, that R is going to be nothing but the cardinality of lambda. So now you can see that, so these are all mutually commuting cycles. Why? Because they are all, they corresponds to, their support actually corresponds to disjoint uh, orbits, okay. So now it is easy to see sigma has to be just product of this sigma 1 etcetera sigma okay. So I will leave it you to verify all of, all of this. So this is like once you have constructed what is the sigma i then it is not hard to prove that the sigma is actually just product of this sigma 1 etcetera sigma. Now so once we understand this then uh, from the definition it is very clear that the sigma i is actually associated with this uh, orbits. So, orbits uniquely determines uh, the sigma i. So, because of that the uniqueness of the sigma i or the cyclic decomposition also becomes clear, okay. So, again verify the uniqueness of this cyclic cyclic decomposition. So, all you need to actually check sigma i actually corresponds to O i okay and this i is now coming from this capital lambda. So, more or less it is clear once you know this uh, decomposition into orbits, these orbits are very explicitly given by for example, if it is coming from i then this is going to be i sigma i and so on okay. Because of that so what you are doing you are defining the sigma i which is just restricted sigma restricted to o i on this all other elements are fixed. So, from that you are reconstructing sigma as product of the sigma i's okay. So, this is more or less clear from the definition of sigma i's. So, now the uniqueness is very clear because sigma i corresponds to this orbits y. So, this proves that uh, any given permutation can be written as a product of uh, uh, disjoint cycles. So, now since uh, these disjoint cycles, so they are all like uniquely determined by sigma. So, you can see that if you take the sign of this sigma, you can see that that will be just product of the sign of each sigma i, okay. So, we already have this sign map, recall that the sign map is a map from S n to this plus or minus 1. So, now you can see that if sigma is in the kernel of this sign map, so which we denoted by a n, the alternating group, if and only if the sign of this sigma e must be equal to 1. So, that means if and only if, if you write sigma as 
the product of sigma 1 etcetera sigma r where this is the cyclic decomposition of sigma then you can see that the sign of this sigma is going to be exactly the sign of sigma 1 product etcetera sign of sigma r. But what will be the sign of sigma 1? Okay. So, I will leave it as exercise sign of any cyclic permutation if you write let us say tau which is a cyclic permutation a 1 etcetera a k. So, then the sign of this tau is exactly going to be minus 1 power k plus 1. So, in particularly so this is going to be the sign of sigma is going to be minus 1 power the length of this uh, cycle sigma 1. So, the k is called the length of this tau okay, plus etcetera plus length of this sigma r sigma r plus r. So, then if you keep this aside you can see that so this sin of sigma is 1 if and only if you can see that the length of cycle sigma 1 etcetera plus length of this sigma r plus r that is supposed to be even number. Okay. So now if it is actually a product of uh, so the, the, the sum of the length that should be even that is what it says. So, product if you write it as product of disjoint cycles then if you count the, the length of each cycle and add it then that should be congruent to 0 modulo 2. So, this is one of the characterization for sigma being a. So, we will actually use uh, this kind of characterization uh, later and then we will understand more about uh, uh, this uh, group alternating group A. Okay. I will stop now here. Uh, we will actually continue with uh, some more basic properties in the next lecture. Thank you.